Welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, REAC Inspire Policy and Scoring. Before we begin, please ensure that you've opened the WebEx chat panel by using the associated icon on the bottom right corner of your screen. Please note that all audience audio connections are muted at this time until the Q&A portion of the conference. You may submit written questions throughout the presentation and these will be addressed during Q&A. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided, and send. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the conference over to Tara Rodosovich from REACT. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, today we're gonna talk to you about some elements of the INSPIRE rulemaking. Uh, this is the new rule that just posted on May 11th. Today, we're going to cover the policy part of this, um, how we developed the final rule, what inputs went into it, um, and then also a little bit on scoring. That's the second part of the session. Uh, you're going to hear more from Cliff Cornegay, who's also on the line today from REAC. Um, you're going to hear more about how we are proposing to score inspections under INSPIRE for the public housing and multifamily programs. Um, so it's two parts, but part of a much larger series. There's so many elements of INSPIRE. We wanted to make sure that we gave adequate time um, to the key components and that we allow time for uh, questions and discussion around the new rule. Next slide. Hey, that's me, Tara Radosevich. <laughs> Thank you. So, this is the national stance for the physical inspection of real estate. Um, this rulemaking, it affects all HUD rental assistance programs. That's pretty big for rulemaking. Um, prior to this, we had other standards called UPCS and HQS, which were just those in the public housing programs. But INSPIRE expands our, um, our rental, or excuse me, our inspection process and standards across all of HUD's rental assistance programs. The purpose of our session today and uh, with the content that we delivered through our get ready sessions across the country um, is to make sure that our housing authorities, our owners and our managers, and of course our staff understand the rulemaking process. Um, we wanna connect the dots on the INSPIRE demonstration of that proposed rule and then the core subordinate notices that um, have been coming out to support implementation of the rule. Uh, there still are some areas that are open for comment coming up. A lot of those have closed. I'll go over what those are today. And we wanna make sure that, um, you know, Staff play an important role in helping our housing authorities, our owners and managers get ready for implementation. And I'll go over what those implementation dates are, what happens on the different dates and what we can expect going forward for our programs. Next slide. So, as I mentioned, uh, INSPIRE is going to replace the Uniform Physical Condition Standards and the Housing Quality Standards um, in our regulations. So this is what the proposed rule proposed and what is happening with the final rule. All of these regs, uh, we previously had UPCS was under Part 5 of 24 CFR and HQS is under Part 982 and 983. Uh, for the housing choice voucher and project-based voucher programs. Uh, the INSPIRE final rule revises those sections to put all of our standards and the process for um, releasing and updating standards in part five. Um, under section 982, those of you in the voucher work on voucher programs and 983, you're going to see the new regs uh, will still exist. The term housing quality standards will still exist, but those regs are gonna point to uh, the regs in part five. And part five, you may be familiar with, those were the decent, safe, and sanitary regs that previously supported UPCS. And if there's any policy nerds out there, I'll tell you, UPCS ex uh, essentially lived in policy guidance. Uh, it wasn't fully codified in the regs, but with INSPIRE, much more of our uh, physical condition requirements are now in part five. And then there's a process for how we will um, develop and publish more detailed standards that support INSPIRE. So, part five, so part G, revised, UPCS, because that was living in uh, a guidance and somewhat in the regulations. Uh, we did have reference to it in the FOS regs. That term disappears. Uh, it will no longer exist after the effective date of the rule, except uh, for some additional time for the programs, because they're going to be going, they're going to be using UPCS a little bit longer than the public housing programs. 
And as I mentioned, HQS, the term housing quality standards will still exist. It will still be in 982 and 983. It's just that it will point to the part five regulations. Uh, the other reason the term housing quality standards will still exist and just be synonymous with inspire is that that term housing quality standards are in our statutes um, and HUD can't change a statute through regulation, but we can, we can uh, define through regulation what we mean by HQS. Next slide. All right, so how did we do this? We had inputs and, and a process for how we revise the regulations, but also how we came up with what Inspire will require, um, what standards will apply, how will the app work, uh, you know, the software to complete inspections, uh, but everything we wanted to do uh, to change how HUD inspects and what HUD expects for these inspection processes, uh, it had to go through a rulemaking process. And so, Anything that's a rulemaking when you're doing a change like this, you really have to consider, you must consider public comments. Um, this is a lot of the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, we needed to release all the major components and get public comment on them before they were final. We tested a lot of our standards through the Inspire demonstration. Uh, for those of you, especially in the field where you have housing authorities that opted into the Inspire demonstration, um, there's been a couple rounds of standards for the demo. I think our last one was 2.1. Um, and we tested these standards and now uh, with the Inspire final rule, we got additional comment, which I'll talk about later in the presentation. We're gonna go to Inspire, Dem we're gonna go to Inspire standards 3.0 and the demonstration will end. Um, and then lastly, as I mentioned, we've got an Inspire final rule, but not everything is in the rule. There's gonna be additional information that's coming through what we call our subordinate notices, our core subordinate notices, which will, are, have been published and will be published as final in the federal register. Next slide. All right, so what went into the final rule? Um, you can see here, it, it, a lot of it was already in the proposed rule. These weren't things we changed. Um, part five is getting changed. We're replacing UPCS. We redefined HQS. Um, this slide has all of the other programs that were that are affected by the Inspire final rule. Um, those of you that maybe are in the field, you work with your CPD colleagues. We also changed the uh, inspection standards for the home housing trust fund emergency solution grants continuum of care and the HOPWA housing for persons with AIDS those regs also point to part five now um, and there are some minimum affirmative requirements that all HUD rental assistance programs must meet um, if you are a nerd like me and you like to know what parts of the CFR the code of federal regulations are impacted all your numbers are here um, one other element, though, of the Inspire proposed rule and the Inspire final rule is that we uh, helped continue to implement HOTMA, the Housing Opportunity Through Modernization Act. Uh, there are provisions in HOTMA uh, related to correction of deficiencies uh, cited under HQS that got extended over to Inspire. Um, there are provisions for identifying which conditions are considered life-threatening versus those that are not life-threatening. And we know we have some housing authorities that um, can allow a voucher family to move in if there's just no life-threatening conditions, but they still have to do the inspection and correction of the non-life-threatening conditions. And we had to retain that in Inspire because that is in statute. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the Economic Growth Act included new provisions for how HUD assesses are small rural, small and rural PHAs, um, and the act defined what we mean by small and rural and how we would assess them going forward under FAS and CMAP. Um, and the, the bottom line is that the economic lesson burden those agencies. They're small, they're rural. We don't need to assess them for everything we assess, say, you know, Chicago on Chicago Housing Authority. Next slide. Next slide, thank you. All right, so this is a uh, tiny graphic. Hopefully you can see it, uh, but this is what the Federal Register announcement looked like for the final rule. Uh, the final rule again was released May 11th. Um, in the final rule, uh, it's I think it's clocking in at close to 200 or 200 plus pages, um, but what's in there is uh, could be very interesting read. So the most important parts of the final rule are what changed between the proposed rule and the final rule. Um, what comments were received and what HUD, uh, what HUD's response to those comments are. Um, there were comments that said, well, you should stop, you know, stop assessing us under the FAS rule for X, Y, and Z, and HUD can write an answer that says, we considered your comment, but we're going to continue to do this because 
XYZ. So the response to comments is always very interesting. It helps, um, I think, better articulate what HUD's thinking was around the INSPIRE program, um, what some of the feedback you're going to continue to hear probably from your housing authorities and the industry groups and what our position is on those. Uh, on that feedback, uh, it can help you answer questions, um, but also if you don't have a lot of time to read 200 pages, go to the section that summarizes here's what's changed. Um, and that will also be, it's part of the preamble, which is the first part of the rule. The preamble will articulate what we changed and why. And then in the very end of the federal register, you get to see the preview of the new federal regulations, um, how each part of the CFR is going to change when they print it. Uh, they print the CFR yearly. Once these regs are effective, they will be in the online CFR and the printed CFR. Next slide. All right, so what's the new stuff? Um, so big things we changed with Inspire versus UPCS and HQS is that we added into a regulation that HUD commits to uh, consider our standards, our inspection standards, at least every three years. Um, one of the big reasons we did this is because with UPCS and HQS, those standards haven't been revised in 20 years. A lot can change in 20 years. Our technology for how we assess hazards changes, um, codes change, the things we know about, say, fire safety and protecting residents from hazards in their unit change. Um, another big one that changed is what we know about mold, moisture, and pests. Um, and while those things were included in UPCS, we know a lot more now about um, you know, what severity level can cause asthma, potentially cause asthma. We know a lot more about the health uh, and the impacts of our housing conditions on residents, and we wanted to make sure that we updated it with Inspire, but that we didn't stop there, that we built into the regulations to keep HUD uh, on track to make sure that we, we reconsider those standards at least every three years. What does reconsider mean? It means we, if we're going to make changes, we put them in a notice in the Federal Register and we get public comment and we don't implement those changes until we've received public comment on what those changes are going to be. Uh, we also added affirmative requirements into regulations. So this section of the regs, uh, for those of you that work on voucher programs, it's gonna look familiar because it looks a lot like what used to be a 982 um, with respect to uh, kitchen, having a place to store, prepare food, having a bathroom that can be used in private or a toilet, a flushable toilet. There's things in there that we considered our habitability minimum standards for a unit coming into HUD's rental assistance programs. This was really relevant, especially for the voucher program where we have new units coming in all the time as a family selects a private unit. So you're going to recognize a lot of the language in there, but there's tweaks. Uh, we now have a requirement for safe drinking water in the kitchen and the bathroom. We now have um, a little bit more around what we expect for uh, toilets. Uh, there's little things like that. But then there's also some new things um, like outlets that have GFCI protection if they're near a water source, uh, new requirements for permanent lighting in the kitchens and bathrooms for electrical outlets, um, and then HVAC. So this doesn't say you must have a certain type of HVAC. The affirmative requirements establish what HUD expects for heating, um, and also it gets into a new requirement for minimum temperature standards. Um, these affirmatives in the regulation, this is a big change, I think, for our industry. I think we're going to see a lot of public housing and multifamily properties that are already going to meet these requirements because, you know, they they constructed a unit that has a clear bathroom and a kitchen and meets all of those other things. You know, the newer your property is, the easier it's going to meet those affirmatives. Um, it could be tricky for the voucher program. Um, this is an area, and we'll talk a little bit about it, in the scoring notice where HUD is considering that some of these requirements are going to feel very new to our landlords and housing authorities. And so we're offering, uh, we plan to offer some flexibility around how these affirmatives are scored. Um, so the two things you need to look at to understand how inspections are changing are these affirmatives in the reg. They're all in 5.703 uh, and then the INSPIRE standards. Um, we're not going to go into depth on the standards today. That is a future session. Um, we will be able to talk about it because the standards will be final by the time of that next session, likely. Another big change, we removed the site and neighborhood requirements for the voucher program. Um, this regulation, we got a lot of comments on it. You'll see the discussion in the, um, uh, in the preamble, but we got a lot of comments about how sometimes these site and neighborhood requirements, which included traffic, noise, 
uh, ex excessive vibrations. Um, it created some challenges for housing authorities and families trying to find units in, that qualified for the voucher program. We removed that specific regulation on site and neighborhood requirements. Um, there are some broader requirements for the outside of a property. Um, and also for health and safety hazards, but it's now not a regulatory requirement that a housing authority consider those other environmental conditions and neighborhood conditions um, for HQS. Uh, we have new nomenclature. So on the public housing and multifamily side, folks are probably familiar with EHNS, Exigent Health and Safety Standards. These were conditions that when REAC went out to the site, uh, if they found items that were considered EHNS, they had to be uh, corrected within 24 hours. And then uh, 72 hours, they had to, the housing authority would have to certify that they were corrected. So we have new nomenclature now. It's no longer EHNS is gone. Uh, it will be wiped clean from the internet and all guidance. The new terms are life threatening, severe, moderate, and low. Um, life threatening, we created that as part of aligning our programs. Uh, along with HATMA, because HATMA created the term life-threatening deficiencies. And so now the voucher program and the public housing program will both have life-threatening conditions and they will be the same. Um, we also included in the rule though, for public housing programs, life-threatening and severe conditions will require a 24-hour correction. Um, and there will be, there's a requirement that the housing authority upload evidence of that correction. Uh, within 72 hours. So it's not going to just be a certification that those conditions were corrected. It's going to be an actual evidence and we'll define in guidance what that evidence looks like. It could be a work order, uh, a picture if there's, if it's clear that it's the same deficiency that was cited by REAC. Um, we're going to release more information in the guidance, implementing guidance. Uh, that's covered that bullet. So self inspections. So those of you in the public housing program, hopefully know, uh, and this came up during the pandemic, that our public housing properties already have a requirement for self-inspections, um, annual self-inspections of units to ensure that um, they are still meeting the housing condition requirements. The INSPIRE rule puts this into regulation. It also extends it over to the multifamily housing program. But then the other item that is very new and will feel very new to housing authorities is that we're going to start collecting those self-inspections if the property score is under 60. Um, these are in the regs. There, there's two places that a self-inspection is in the reg. There's a reg that requires that they do the self-inspection, and then there's a reg that requires um, a post-inspection survey. When you score under 60, the housing authority or owner in multifamily programs needs to complete the inspection according to the INSPIRE standards, and those will get submitted to HUD through the INSPIRE app. Lastly, the other item that's going to feel very big and new to PIH staff and our housing authorities are administrative referrals to the DEC. The DEC is the Departmental Enforcement Center. Um, in the public housing world, we've worked with the DEC around, they can do financial assessments, they do other, uh, they used to do snapshots of our housing authorities if we requested that they go out to look at operations. Um, administrative referrals to the DEC for public housing aligns our program with multifamily housing programs. And that alignment is that when a property scores 30 and below, there is an automatic referral to the DEC for follow-up. If there are two successive scores under 60, um, we also added into the regulation that we could uh, consider that property for an administrative referral to the DEC. The details about what a DEC referral looks like, what the DEC can do, how the DEC will follow up, there are some of those regulations. There'll be more information coming in the INSPIRE administrative notice and as part of, uh, I think there's an MOU um, currently drafted and pending for execution that will uh, outline how PIH interacts with the DEC. So stay tuned. Next slide. All right, so we've also got some inspection timeframe changes. So in the multifamily world and to a lesser extent in public housing, um, we had standard one, two, and three for how often our properties were inspected. And the three, two, one rule is they were either inspected every three years, every two years, or every one year based on their prior score. Um, this is not totally new to the public housing world, um, but what is new is that I don't have it on the slide, but it's coming up. We are uncoupling for most housing authorities. We are going to uncouple the timing of their inspection from their fiscal year end. So this helps some housing authorities, for example, 
Uh, you know, we heard a lot from housing authorities that say they have a 1231 fiscal year end and then suddenly react shows up on 1220 and inspects all their properties. Um, that will no longer be the case. We will time the next inspection off of the date of the prior inspection and the score. So you could see some changes over the years of the inspection timing because it'll be property by property and not housing authority um, dictated by their fiscal year end. Now that is the case for housing authorities with over 250 units um, and not those that are small and rural. So for and then let me jump to the next one, which is troubled housing authorities. That reg doesn't change with INSPIRE. We kept it exactly as it is under section 902. Um, they will still get inspected annually. And that will still be around their fiscal year end because those regs are more tied to how we um, rate and assess troubled housing authorities under FAS. So that didn't change. They will still get inspected annually and it will still be largely around their fiscal year end so that we can keep up with their FAS core issuance. Uh, this will also help hopefully with housing authorities that are under a recovery agreement, we can continue to have new information about their property conditions, um, and hopefully they can make progress under their recovery agreement and uh, action plan. All right, next category, small deregulation PHAs. So we call these small deregs. Um, those are housing authorities with less than 250 units. Those, the way those properties are inspected will not change. This is where it gets kind of confusing because I, the original INSPIRE proposed rule attempted to uh, align all housing authority inspections, except for small and rural, attempted to align them to the 321 rule. Uh, but we had those small DREG regs in two different places, and we only revised one of those places. And so we had to retain the small DREG housing authority inspection frequency, and those will still be based on their prior FOS score. So their rule is there on the slide with the three, the two, or annual if they're troubled. Then lastly, small rural housing authorities. So these are housing authorities with fewer than 500, but it's combined voucher and uh, public housing units. Um, this is straight from the act. This was not a HUD decision. The Economic Growth Act defined them as less than 500, um, but they also have certain conditions for uh, the demographics that, that verify that they're rural. This list, it's already published, I think, on our um, on the HUD website. If it's not on the REACT website, it's on the the site for small DREG or operating fund. Um, this list will get published officially as part of implementation of INSPIRE. And for those housing authorities, unless they're troubled, they're only gonna get scored every three years. So they're gonna get a FAS score every three years and their properties are gonna get inspected every three years. Their FAS score is going to be based entirely on their physical condition score. The other catch though with small rural PHAs is we've set a new standard for what we considered a troubled small and rural housing authority. And that's if, if they have more than one amp and you average those, they have uh, they score less than 70. Next slide. All right, so I jumped into this. Small and rural agencies, once it'll be three years, unless they're troubled. Their FAS score is only based on their physical inspection scores. It's a unit weighted average across their properties if they have more than one amp. And if they're below 70, we consider them troubled. If a small and rural agency is troubled, they go back to annual. So there's no three, two, one for a small and rural, it's only three or one. Um, the other change coming with the implementation or with the effective date of the INSPIRE rule is how we handle FA scoring. So we made a decision early on that we didn't wanna blend the physical condition indicator uh, under FOS. And that's because we know that Inspire is so different from UPCS that if we were to blend those scores together, we were going to have winners and losers. Um, we could potentially have agencies where maybe 70% of their properties are under UPCS and 20 are under FOS or reverse. You know, we think we're going to see changes in some of the housing authority property scores. And we wanted to be fair and say that we wouldn't we didn't want to help some agencies and harm others, so we made a decision that we would not blend FAS scores. So what does that mean? Um, with the implementation of INSPIRE, uh, for some housing authorities that have a lot of AMPs, it's going to take a few years to get through all of their properties, especially those that are on a three-year cycle. Uh, so we made a decision that we would not update an agency's physical condition indicator until all of their portfolio is uh, inspected under INSPIRE. Now, if you're a troubled agency or a small agency, REACT probably will get to those agencies in the first year or so. 
Um, and so they could get an updated physical condition indicator under FAS, but if not, um, it'll be a few years. We will carry forward their previous physical condition indicator until their whole portfolio is inspected. Now, that being said, if you have a housing authority that very much wants to get inspected, um, we can uh, receive those requests and move them up in the priority to get them done. It, and by wants to get inspected, what I mean is uh, if they want to have all of their properties scored under Inspire because they want an updated FAS score or physical condition indicator, REACT can entertain those and work them into um, the inspection planning. Next slide. All right, so what are these implementing notices? You probably heard me mention a few times that it's not just the rule. We've got to get the details into implementing notices. So there's there's three biggies, uh, three big ones to implement Inspire. Standards notice, the scoring notice, and the administrative notice. So the standards notice that went into the Federal Register last summer, uh, I think it was published mid-June. We, we reviewed comments, we reviewed comments on the actual standards. There was a notice and an attachment with the standards. We received comments on all of it. It was a big effort, a lot of work. What's coming out uh, soon, very soon, because they're pending with OMB and we hear that they're almost done. Um, you will see a final standards notice announcing that these are the final standards. It will describe what some of the changes are between the proposed notice and standards that went out in June versus now the final standards. Um, and it will be the new final uh, standards that will apply to our properties. This is the biggest one and Cliff Cornegay, who's on the line today for the second part of our presentation, um, Cliff, um, Cliff was a uh, large part the author of these standards working with the team. Um, he is your expert and we're going to have a whole session on the Inspire standards at a later date. Uh, but again, watch for those. They're coming very soon in the Federal Register, coming soon to a theater near you in the Federal Register and you will see what those standards are. And then we'll update, there's a page on the REACT website where we have the Inspire standards that we use for the demonstration. We will update that page with each individual standard. And the reason we do that is because it's really hard to read a 200 page standards document and find the particular item you're looking for. The website will lay it out um, by component. So if you wanna know what does uh, HUD require for fire doors, it will be there. Scoring notice. So the scoring notice recently came out. Um, it was published in the Federal Register and uh, we received comments on it. We're gonna talk today about what we proposed for scoring. So scoring is only applicable to properties in the multifamily and public housing universe. Uh, these are properties that REACT inspects and we issue a score from zero to 100. I've talked a little bit today about how we average those for FAS. We're not getting into FAS today, but that's what happens with your score. It gets averaged for your physical condition indicator under FAS. Scoring under INSPIRE also triggers a lot of other follow-up and action from our housing authorities. And it's new under INSPIRE that we have follow-up based on an individual property score, which means we've now got, we're gonna have follow-up on scores under 60, scores 30 and under. It's new things for the public housing universe that are gonna be based on that score. And so we had to get it right. We put a proposed notice out to get comments. Um, we've just finished wrapping up those comments and the scoring final scoring notice is going to be coming in departmental clearance very soon. And then once it's reviewed and approved by OMB, we can publish it to the Federal Register as our final scoring methodology. Uh, the administrative notice. So to implement Inspire, uh, we have to make sure we're clear about what the process is to schedule inspections, what information we'll be seeking in advance of inspections, what's expected for uh, correcting deficiencies, what's expected for, you know, on your day of the inspection, what can you, what, what can you expect <laughs> on your day of the inspection, how will we inspect, uh, and how can you uh, request a technical review. All of those administrative elements of the rule will be in the administrative notice. Um, that one has gone through departmental clearance already. We have some non-concurs from uh, some of our partner offices, housing and healthy homes and general counsel. Um, we've got to work through those non-concurs and ideally we will issue the administrative notice, I would say mid-June um, and that will be done. It has to be done in advance of the final rules effective date. So the administrative notice is coming soon. Small rural. Uh, so we have a little bit more time on implementing the small rural requirements because those housing authorities, I think we have uh, 120 days after the final rule, we publish the list and then we've got a process for baselining those agencies and then um, starting a new FAS assessment process. Uh, I haven't mentioned this before now, but we're also changing the CMAP requirements. There's going to be fewer indicators 
for CMAP for these small and rural agencies. You will see that all in a small rural notice. Um, that one, I'm not sure where it is in the pipeline because another group is working on it, but that one I would expect to see uh, if, if not by July, um, end of the summer. We're also going to see new implementing notices for the community planning and development programs, CPD programs. CPD is going to issue those themselves. Um, if you have any housing authorities with units in those programs, they need to wait and see um, for what the requirements will be. And then we'll also have a notice, actually on this one, you'll see two notices. So the Inspire Administrative Notice is going to have the new process for uh, resident feedback. Uh, the, the first process we're implementing for resident feedback is that resident councils can nominate up to five units, or nominate any units, but we'll select up to five, can nominate units for REACT to add to the inspection on inspection day. The administrative notice will describe how we're going to reach out to those resident groups, what information we'll collect, um, and how we'll orchestrate and, and follow up with the resident councils about the, the units to be inspected. Those units will get inspected just like every other unit that's selected under a REACT inspection for scoring. Um, it will not be obvious which units were resident selected versus those that were just randomly sampled. Um, and the results of those uh, inspections will still be provided to the housing authority so that they can correct the conditions. And uh, they're gonna have to follow all the same requirements for deficiencies that are, that are cited. For example, if there are life-threatening and severe conditions in these units, uh, that the residents nominated, the housing authority is still going to be required to correct those conditions within 24 hours and uh, upload evidence of that correction to HUD. There will be another notice for resident feedback coming uh, in the next month related to a customer satisfaction survey. Uh, we've got a team within REACT that's been working. Um, we've got a customer satisfaction group um, out of HUD headquarters. They're working on a survey that we can get to residents and that, announce, that notice will announce it. Next slide. All right, the Inspire Standards Notice, I did mention this, but I want to highlight some key items that were put out for a proposal. So I mentioned early on that the Inspire regulations um, included, uh, and actually the proposed rule had some questions around uh, mold and water and permanent heating source, minimum temperatures. We got some comments on the rule, but we needed more comments before before we put out the Inspire standards, we needed more public input on some of these other trickier items. Um, like how should we assess safe drinking water? We know that housing authorities aren't the water supplier. They're not doing water testing. What should HUD require? Because we're not EPA. What should or could HUD require if we were to add safe drinking water to our Inspire regulations? Um, we asked questions about a permanent heating source. Uh, we suspected that there were units in some climate areas that perhaps didn't have a permanent heating source, and maybe we were allowing residents to rely on space heaters. Um, so we asked about, you know, what does that look like if we were to require a permanent heating source for every HUD-assisted rental unit? Uh, minimum temperature. On minimum temperature, there's a requirement under HOTMA that public housing, that HUD needs to establish a minimum temperature uh, for public housing units that the unit not go under. And um, we had a lot of questions about, uh, you know, aligning that across our programs, but also how should HUD measure it um, and what standards should we apply and should we consider um, certain geographic zones and then electrical outlets. You know what, Cliff, I think if you are on the line, maybe I'm gonna hand this slide to you if you wanna add some more information about the standards notice. Sure, so the standards notice, uh... It's with OMB, it should come back shortly. Um, we did have 13 questions there, and I'll go into greater depth on this when we have the standards uh, presentation in a week or two. Uh, there may end up being more than 63 tables just because we, with the affirmative requirements, we ended up adding some additional uh, standards due to the carryover from HQS into the uh, public housing multifamily world. Um, we did have a hot melt life threatening um, work on the hot melt list uh, that's also attached to that notice. Um, but for the electrical outlets, specifically, we're looking at GFCIs, uh, we're looking at properly wired outlets, a minimum number of outlets. Uh, we're looking at potentially different uh, correction timeframes uh, for properties when they're dealing with infestation. If they're using industry best practices, an example of that would be uh, potentially integrated pest management. Uh, for minimum temperature part, that's that's new. I'll talk a little bit about that in the scoring as well, but uh, we did look at those geographic regions. 
Um, and we looked across regional maps and historical temperatures before making that decision. So there are exceptions there. Uh, and specifically, we were looking at permanent heating sources just because we wanted to consider yeah, the potential risks that occur with uh, temporary heating, like fireplaces, uh, space heaters, even in circumstances with uh, unvented fuel burning space heaters that we needed to consider. Uh, so there were multiple questions in there regarding that. Um, you know, and if you look at the standards notes, you can read through those. We'll be addressing those in the final standards notice. Uh, we'll also include rationales in, terms, in regards to whether or not, you know, why we did it and whether or not we included it in the final standards. I'll add here at the end, as I mentioned, the final standards notice revises the HOTMA life threatening list. That is those conditions that uh, cannot be present for a family to move in. And if they are present, they have to be corrected within 24 hours um, so that the family can continue to live there. But also, I should have put first, it's about um, HAP enforcement. So if there are life threatening conditions and they're not corrected within 24 hours, the housing authority needs to initiate HAP enforcement with the owner um, and then establish what time frames for the work to get completed. Next slide. The scoring notice, we are going to talk in depth about this, but I'm just going to hit some of the highlights in the 2nd part of our session and we'll talk in depth. Some of the highlights here, it did go in the federal register for comments uh, late March. We had a 30 day comment period. We had a lot of comments. Um, what's key about the scoring notice is that scoring. Uh, you know, we inspect if you look at how HUD establishes what we can regulate, it's huge. We've got inside all the spaces within a building, all the units outside site exterior our authority is very broad but we don't always inspect everything and we don't always score everything so the scoring notice is where we can really get down to brass tacks and say this is what hud cares about the scoring reflects our inspire goals our goals are to improve the health and safety of our residents improve their health and safety by focusing on those spaces in a building where they spend the most time they spend the most time in their units um, Secondarily, the inside spaces, like their common areas or laundry rooms, community centers. And then lastly, the outside, the site, um, the exterior of the building and the site walking in, they can encounter um, hazardous conditions. So Inspire is based on, that's the whole premise of the rule, where residents spend time and the health and safety of those residents in the places where they spend their time. The big change between Inspire and UPCS is we excluded items that were more like curb appeal. Um, did the siding match on the side of the property? Were there cracks in the sidewalk? Even if there were cracks in the sidewalk, you know, unless they are a health and safety tripping hazard, um, they're not going to be assessed the same way under Inspire as they were under UPCS. And the scoring will reflect that. So you're going to see in depth how we categorize life threatening. The biggest condition that will result in the largest deduction of points are life threatening conditions in the units. And then it varies by the level of the severity of the, the deficiency and the location of it. All of our decisions around scoring, um, we put that model out there. We got a ton of comments on it. Our final decisions will be in the final scoring notice. Um, look for that in June. The scoring notice, notice must get done by July 1, the effective date of the INSPIRE rule, because if it doesn't, we can't actually inspect and score. We can inspect, <laughs> but we can't score the properties. So the scoring notice, uh, we are pushing it through departmental clearance and OMB review at breakneck speeds because we have to get it published by July 1 to be able to inspect and score under INSPIRE in the public housing portfolio. Um, the scoring notice also has our sampling strategy. The sampling strategy has changed a bit from UPCS in that we, um, for smaller properties, we'll probably just be adding a couple more units for larger properties. I think we're adding another like five to 10 units. Um, previously, UPCS had what we said was statistically valid sampling, um, but we went back and looked at the statistically valid portion of that, and we were not inspecting enough units to meet that 90% confidence interval. Um, there were likely decisions made along the way to limit the amount of time that we're at a property, both for um, you know resources, but also just the time that we're there disturbing the housing authority and the unit and the residents and their units. Um, we've also got in the proposed notice, we outlined ways that a property can fail. Uh, we still have 60 as the initial pass fail for public housing properties. If you are below 60, it's considered a fail. What we've also added to inspire is that if the points, 
the scores for your units uh, are below a certain threshold, the whole property is going to fail. And that is because the Inspire rule is about the units and where residents spend the most time. So if you have potentially a perfect property, the site, the interior spaces, everything is, is crystal clear, beautiful, perfect, no, no deficiencies, but your units are in really bad shape with a lot of life-threatening conditions, that property is going to fail, even if the, uh, the deductions would have gotten you over a 60. And we describe that in the scoring notice and we'll issue our final decision in the final scoring notice. Next slide. All right, the administrative notice. As I mentioned, this is the nuts and bolts, um, how you get your inspection, information we're gonna collect in advance of the inspection. So what's new here, uh, or it's gonna feel new for our properties, we're gonna ask them, we, we were already asking for elevator and fire sprinkler certificates and other certificates in advance, or actually we did it on site, I apologize. Um, that will be done in advance now, as opposed to having the REACT inspector go through files and collect all this at the site. Um, we're going to ask the housing authorities to upload this information, and we're going to ask if the field offices can assist in making sure that information gets uploaded. And then the inspector assigned um, will do a check to make sure we have that information. Um, we're going to have a process to confirm the unit and building information. It's going to come in from PIC, um, but we have found that sometimes what's in PIC doesn't line up with what we see at the property. Uh, but we do need to make sure that we are following what's in the system of record and that REACT's inspection is based on the correct number of units and buildings and um, occupied units. We're going to ask about whether the housing authority is aware of any water safety alerts. Uh, so usually, like if there's a lead in water or a boil water advisory, uh, the local water utility company is going to notify all of its customers. We're going to ask housing authorities if they're aware of any water safety alerts. And then we're also going to ask them the name of their public water supply system. Um, this, this requirement for the water safety information, that is directly related to um, some of the issues we've had in Flint, Jackson, and other cities where the public water supply system was not safe. And if you are not able to deliver safe drinking water to the units, it puts the housing authority and the owner in violation of our standards. And so what we wanna do is start collecting more information in advance um, so that we can be prepared if one of these water alerts happens and we have unsafe drinking water. We're also gonna ask for the property construction date. So those of you that have worked for HUD for a while, you know probably that there are a lot of construction dates in PIC. We've got a DOFA, what is that date of final something date? Uh, we got a DOFA date, but we also have property construction dates. We can have really huge AMPs in the public housing program with a bunch of different construction dates um, by the building, by building and unit, uh, unit numbers. Uh, with Inspire, we wanna get better information property by property. And that would be what is the construction date of that property. Even if there's 10 properties in the AMP, we need a construction date for each one. Um, the system, it may take a little while before our system is fully updated to collect all those dates, but we are going to ask that in advance. The reason we are asking for those property construction dates is because we have to get it right with respect to lead-based paint. If the property was built before 1978 and it's not otherwise exempt, we'll give them a chance to say it's exempt, we're going to we're we're gonna collect a scan of their lead-based paint inspection or risk assessment. And, you know, sometimes these can be many, many binders of testing information. We can just collect the, uh, the executive summary of that. And all of this information will be in the administrative notice. We're gonna ask the, the, for the contact information for the resident council. And then the notice will also describe what's the new process for technical reviews, um, how you correct your deficiencies, how you report, how you communicate with the residents after your inspection, wow, this font is tiny, and then uh, what the process is for self-inspections and the administrative referrals. So on this one, I know I'm throwing a lot at you. It's all gonna be in the administrative notice coming soon, late May. Uh, late May, actually this one, given where we are in the review process, I predict mid-June, we'll have to update this. Um, one of the big things in here that's gonna be new for field offices especially is this process for technical reviews. Um, I see the question in the chat. There's no more database adjustments. Um, the, the items that were available as database adjustments, the, the items that fell under that category, everything is now a technical review. Um, those items are still available. We didn't delete any regulations. We just all moved them into a new category called technical reviews. Um, the, the process is changing. The process for how those go through the field office first before they come to REAC is going to change. Right now we're anticipating that all of this will come to REAC because Inspire is so new. Um, so just 
bookmark the whole process for database adjustments and technical reviews is changing. The standards aren't changing, but the process will change. And we'll announce that in the administrative notice. Um, one other item here I just want to say with respect to the self-inspection process, there are some more details in the regs that you'll want to read on this. Um, the self-inspection process, if, you know, if you're a property that scores over 60, you don't have to send it to HUD. You still need to do your self-inspections. They should be done according to the INSPIRE standards. Um, we know that in the first couple of years of INSPIRE implementation that those, um, those self-inspections aren't going to look like a perfect INSPIRE inspection done by a REACT inspector. We know that, we understand that, uh, but they should still be inspecting to the INSPIRE standards. And again, if the housing authority scored under 60 for that property, HUD's gonna collect a copy of that self-inspection. Next slide. All right, so this was a slide that we used in our get ready sessions. Um, we had a lot of pressure from the industry and our housing authorities. Why is this taking so long? You guys put the proposed rule out uh, over, well, we were probably at two years. Why can't you tell us what's in the proposed rule? Um, what's wonderful about this session is the final rule is out and we can tell you a lot more, but just for background, and I think a lot of folks working at HUD for many years understand this, rulemaking is slow. Um, we have to adhere to the Administrative Procedures Act. We have to make information available to the same audiences in the same way. We've got to use the Federal Register. Um, the Federal Register is like the daily news for the federal government. It gets issued every day. It used to be a, a like a black and white magazine you'd go pick up at the government printing office daily. It's all now online. We have to make it available. We have to create public dockets. So as I mentioned, the comments on the proposed rule, the comments on the standards notice, the comments on the scoring notice, they're all available online. You can read whether uh, what the public responded or commented on. Um, you can see what the concerns are. You can read the entire letter that was submitted as a comment. They are all online in the docket. With the final rule, you are also going to see, even though we summarize the comments and they're in the docket, you're also gonna see a regulatory impact analysis. So the, the, the acronym for that is the RIA. The regulatory impact analysis includes, um, will inspections take longer? If so, how much? Um, is there a cost impact to new requirements for smoke detectors and um, permanent heating sources? All of that evaluation was considered with this final rule. Um, we issued that RIA as proposed, we're gonna finalize it, or we did finalize it and it's in the docket. And we worked with HUD's um, PDNR, Policy Development and Research Office to develop that. And that rule is gonna have an effective date um, for when these regulations take effect for the different programs. Next slide. As I mentioned that that rule had the regulatory impact analysis that's covered here on this slide. And I think folks in HUD already know, like, the rule and all these notices, they go through OMB review, that can really slow down. And it's also why we can't tell you this notice will be issued on X date. And it's because we go through OMB and they are allowed time to review these major items before they are published as final. Next slide. So when do the Inspire inspection start? The rule has to be published as final, check, we got that done. Uh, but we also have to have an effective date and the effective date for the Inspire final rule published May 11th, the effective date is July 1, 2023. So Inspire inspections can start after July 1, 2023, but there's more to that story. Next slide. We have to finish all the subordinate notices. As I mentioned, you're gonna see Inspire standards probably pretty soon because we hear that OMB is almost done. We'll publish a final standards notice and all of the final standards. Um, the scoring notice is coming after that, and the administrative notice is coming very soon. All of those notices have to be completed before July 1 so that we can do everything that we've promised to do under the rule. Uh, the final rule has compliance dates. So when we first used this slide before the rule was published, we were kind of cheeky and said, there may be compliance dates. Uh, the answer is there is a compliance date, and that's for multifamily housing programs. So while the regs are effective for multifamily housing programs, just like public housing on July 1, uh, multifamily housing decided to have a compliance date of October 1. Um, that relates to the size of their portfolio. We committed to finishing UPCS inspections in their portfolio. And also we know they need to do some system updates in their IREM system to be ready for October 1. So they have a compliance date of October 1. That means that UPCS inspections are gonna keep happening in the multifamily portfolio until October 1. And then after October 1, 
UPCS is on a cruise ship sailing off into the sunset. It will not exist any longer. If you see UPCS on HUD's website or in an old notice, just know that it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, public housing regs. We were planning an, uh, an effective date of April. That is now July. Uh, and I got that. Oh, okay. So the other big effective date in the regulations is for our voucher programs and our project-based voucher programs. Their effective date is October 1, 2023. Um, that's also the case for the Section 8 Mod Rehab. We still have some of those units out there and the CPD programs. Their effective date is October 1. While inspections can start July 1, um, I mean, that's going to be a holiday weekend. We don't expect to be out there on July 4th or 3rd. Uh, I would expect to see the REAC notice of inspections rolling out soon to give them advance notice. And then we will be conducting inspections starting after, uh, I think that Monday is July 5th, whatever the after the holiday. So we're not going to show up holiday weekend. It would be the week after July 1st. And I'll say that it's going to be a slow start. Um, I wouldn't expect to see a bunch of REAC inspectors showing up at all your properties that are due that week. Um, you know, implementation can be messy. It can take a little while to get 100% up to speed. We know that we're going to have some flexibility around that inspection date. Um, in the final rule, we said it may be plus or minus six months from the anniversary date. Um, that first year of Inspire is going to be interesting. Get your popcorn. We're all going to watch. It's hard to transition between such major programs. Um, and we're going to ask everybody, you know, bear with us. We're going to communicate. We're going to support you. We're going to answer your questions. It may not be everything you expect. It's not going to be as um, efficient as UPCS is now because it's a brand new program. We've got inspectors learning all the new standards. We're going to have housing authorities learning all the new standards. We may have little system glitches. We expect all of this, but we're going to get there. Um, and we will continue to stay in touch with you and answer questions and, and work together to implement Inspire. Next slide. Key takeaways. Our physical condition standards are in the regulations. We're required under statute to have decent, safe, and sanitary housing. HUD defines that in our regulations and our implementing notices, which are open for comment. We're not going to change anything overnight. We have to go through this uh, balanced process to consider public comment and make the same information available to all audiences in the same way so they can comment. We tested a lot of this. It's not new, new. We tested a lot of our Inspire standards in our demonstration. We're very grateful for the volunteers in that demonstration. Um, they may have a leg up on some of their peers that were not in the demonstration. They're going to understand uh, that terminology right away, life-threatening, severe, uh, moderate, and low. The testing and the inspections that were done under the demonstration, they were not scored. Um, we are issuing some scores now. They're like provisional, like this is what you would have scored if you were inspected, but none of those scores are scores of records. It was all part of testing standards and the scoring in the demonstration. Um, there's also some, we call them pilot inspections. Those are properties that are not um, part of the demonstration, but they agree to um, work with React to test the app. Um, those of you that have ever worked on software, it's called user acceptance testing. We had some housing authorities volunteer to do user accepting testing and test the app. Those are also not scored inspections and they're not demonstration inspections either. We didn't even, um, in most of those, we didn't sample the correct number of units. It was really about app testing. So if you were asked about the pilot inspections, send those folks to REAC, we'll help you answer those questions, but those were not demonstration inspections. Inspections will commence once the rule is final and effective. That's after July 1. Uh, that date that we're hoping for, we missed that, but we are on track for July 1, and that's when our inspections in the public housing portfolio will commence. Next slide. Questions and feedback. I know we've got a lot in the chat. Okay, did you also want to take audio questions at this time? Sure, why don't we start with the audio questions, and then we'll go to the chat. Okay, so to our WebEx attendees, you may enter the question queue by clicking the raise hand emoticon, which is located at the bottom of the screen. Our attendees that are dialed in on the phone, uh, please dial pound two and you'll hear the notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please then state your name and question. Okay, it looks like we do have a verbal question here. I'll go ahead and unmute this. Caller. My, my name is Paul Michalka. I'm out of the uh, combined Buffalo-Pittsburgh Office of Public Housing. 
Uh, I have more of a comment uh, leading up to the implementation, especially for the the HCV uh, or uh, Inspire V program. Uh, I strongly recommend that that REAC and OFO get together and have some sort of a uh, draft implementation plan for housing authorities, uh, especially as far as making sure that their employees get trained, that they have the uh, computer software and handheld devices to connect into the system, uh, you know, procure uh, procure the uh, software. Um, software and um, IT services that they need, because it's going to be a complete disaster, especially for the HCV program, uh, because of the lack of participants with the demonstration side, with the voucher side. And we're dealing with a lot of small housing authorities that uh, have always used paper, uh, the HQS uh, checklist. So I think that they, they definitely need some sort of a plan and proposal of where they should be at leading up to that October 1st, uh, October 1st uh, effective date when they're gonna completely switch in many cases from paper to computer. Same thing on the uh, the public housing, but lesser to an extent, uh, there, there should be some sort of a proposed uh, plan. This is where you should be at if you're a larger housing authority or if you're a small housing authority. Uh, because it, it's going to be, especially when it comes to annual inspections and uh, having them get get the uh, the training that they need. That's all I have. Thank you. That act is really great feedback. Uh, I was about to tell you to email that to me, uh, but I did take some notes. Um, you are on the mark. You're absolutely right. Uh, I didn't cover a lot of the voucher program today because we're so focused on that July 1 public housing date. Uh, but you're absolutely right. We got to get our housing authorities ready for October 1. Um, I can tell you that internally we're considering that there may be some housing authorities that aren't ready to fully switch to Inspire on October 1, and we could potentially um, authorize them to retain HQS uh, for a, a period of time until they're fully ready to convert to Inspire. Uh, so on the on the REAC side, we're talking to the software vendors to see if they can update their software that they sell to housing authorities for HQS inspections. Um, we're gonna be sharing all of our Inspire standards with them as soon as they're final. We had a meeting actually last week with software vendors. Um, there's still so much work to do. You're right that we also have housing authorities that um, they still are paper-based. And we heard that in the get ready sessions, smaller ones. We do need to update, I see this question in the chat. We need to update the 52580 um, those forms to cover what's an Inspire versus HQS. Um, we know we need to update that. We're going to update the chapters of the um, HCV guidebook. I think it's chapters 10 and 17 on how to do an HQS inspection, or excuse me, an Inspire inspection uh, in voucher units. Absolutely have a lot of work. We continue to, um, we welcome feedback from OFO. Thank you. I know uh, my boss, uh, Das Ash Sheriff, is talking to um, Das. Uh, Felicia Gaither on that implementation plan, but also additional training um, for field staff specifically, because we know that you all, if you want to support your housing authorities, you, get, you have to be able to answer their questions. Um, and then lastly, I'll say, since time is a bit tight today, um, we absolutely understand that the housing authority staff need to be as trained as REAC inspectors, um, and that while we've put some content up related to the demo, we haven't posted all of the training for housing authority staff, um, and it's coming soon. And we're going to get that out there um, and we're going to continue to receive feedback. Uh, I had mentioned that that Inspire administrative notice is coming in the next month because we have to get that out by July 1. That's actually only going to cover public housing and multifamily programs. It's not the HCV administrative notice and how that's going to work. Um, look for that after we get past July 1, I would say August, September. We will issue all of those, uh, all of the guidance for agencies with voucher programs in that notice. And so, yes, let's keep talking between REAC and OFO so we can NOHB, OPHVP, and the Moving to Work program so we can get it right for those agencies. So, thank you for your feedback. Okay. Did you want to take additional questions or perhaps wait until the end of the conference? Uh, so let me catch some of these in the chat here. I think I can see them if I close out some panels. Um, so first I will say that because time is tight, we're not gonna get all of the questions in the chat, uh, but we can follow up with you. I am 99% sure that we are sending these slides right after this. I think they are all gonna be available. 
um, so that we can make sure you have the information you need. All right, so I see one question about the scoring calculator. Um, so the scoring calculator, just so that you know what that is, um, we took the proposed scoring notice and turned it into an Excel um, spreadsheet where you could enter if I had 12 unit defects at the life-threatening level, what would my score possibly be? Um, it's just an estimate of what the score might be. What's missing from the scoring calculator are the final decisions on the um, items which may not be scored in the first year. Um, we had slides today on the scoring model, but I think given where we are in time, and I apologize that this has taken a little bit longer and I do wanna get your questions, I think we probably should go with the questions and answer more of those and we'll push scoring off to a later date. Um, but for that calculator, it, it doesn't show what things might not get scored in the first year. That was something that we proposed in the scoring notice. Um, some things like the call for aid, may not get scored, some of those new affirmatives like guardrails, handrails, permanent heating source, we may not score those, we're considering not scoring those in the first year. So while the calculator was hopefully useful to just estimate what your score might be, um, you still need the final standards and you need the final decisions on the Inspire scoring notice. We will update that calendar or that calculator once we have finalized the standards and the scoring model. Uh, let's see, slides coming. All right, so I have a development that scored less than 60 last year under UPCS, and we're still waiting for the reinspection, which is overdue. Uh, I'm not sure what the reinspection would be. We don't routinely reinspect every under 60. Um, uh, if it's a troubled, oh, if you mean just their next follow up inspection? Um, So if they received a UPCS inspection recently this year, um, you know, we had a big inspection program goal to complete inspections at all properties that we missed during the pandemic pause. Um, if they haven't gotten one this year, they would probably wait until Inspire to get inspected. So it would be after July 1. Um, if there's a reason that property should be inspected before July 1, um, shoot us an email. Uh, Probably inspired hud.gov is the best one for now. I will put this in the chat. Um, send us an email. We can look into whether they are coming up again soon for an inspection. Um, we absolutely understand that um, some properties, you know, they want to show progress against a um, recovery agreement or plan of um, of their physical conditions. If it's overdue, it probably is already slated, but we can check for you if you email us at inspiredhut.gov. Uh, I think we addressed, I'll say it again, we are planning to update the HUD 52580 so that we can implement Inspire for voucher programs and have a form available to those agencies that need them. Uh, the REAC email to ins request inspections, you know, I think we've been using the TAC, but I'm not 100% sure. Why don't we, for this session, if there's something you are looking for, go ahead and send it to inspiredhut.gov so that Cliff Martin and I see it. Um, but the the point of contact to request inspections after Inspire might change. Uh, wait for the Inspire administrative notice to clarify that. Slides are coming. Ah, resident councils. Are there criteria for the resident councils? Um, are there criteria for they should use to nominate units? No. They can give us any units that they would like REAC to inspect. Um, you know, we're really open if the residents, if they don't want to give us units to inspect, if they don't want to participate, that's okay. But if they um, want REACT to include additional units when we're at the site, we'll take them and we will inspect those. I should have clarified that that, um, that proposal to inspect additional units nominated by the residents, um, that came from our advocacy groups, the National Association of HUD Tenants and the National Low Income Housing Council. Uh, they su they suggested that REAC add that um, to our final rule, and we did. And we got a lot of comments on it. With the implementation, implementation date so close, I'm concerned that staff and PHAs have not seen a draft version of the Inspire Inspection Report or deficiency notices. Um, yeah, I mean, if they're, if they're participating in the demo, they would see what an Inspire Inspection Report and deficiency notice is. We're gonna, it's described in the rule what they'll receive. Um, and how it's going to be broken out, and then we'll give more details in the administrative notice. So what our housing authorities can expect is on the day of inspection, they're going to get a list of the life-threatening and severe conditions that need correction. Um, they can compare that, th there'll be details in that, that initial report 
uh, they'll get it as a PDF. They can compare it to, they would need to still go to the Inspire standards to look up the full information of what the defect is uh, and what the concerns are. Um, the inspection report is gonna essentially be, it's gonna be similar to what they were receiving. It's just that the deficiencies will indicate you know, their severity level um, and where they were identified in the units, which units had those deficiencies or inside areas. So it's not gonna be dramatically different. Um, if there's folks that are in the demonstration, um, it will look very similar to that. Next question. And then I can, you know what, um, Marta, could you come on the line for a second? Do you, should I keep going on the questions and maybe we punt on, an, on scoring altogether? So I have um, a little bit of intel on some of those questions and then maybe Cliff can do maybe just a quick preview of um, scoring at the very end. And then when we jump to our June 20th session, we can combine standards and scoring if that kind of works for everyone. Does that sound like a good plan? That's good for me. Do, should we That's wait to hear the objections? Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, and uh, I think there was a question too about uploading the, um, what documents need to be uploaded. And um, some of the intel on that from our colleague, Kevin Laviano, is that eventually long-term, the goal is to sort of get all of that information uploaded into Salesforce. And the sort of short end, short-term solution to that is that we're going to be um, asking the field offices to review a spreadsheet that we'll be putting up on a SharePoint site. And that's where you'll make sure that the property profile looks correct and input the field office point of contacts to close out the property defects. So it might be uh, the PMS or the engineer. And then after that step is when we move to getting the information, getting you to upload all that information in Salesforce. So I'll say for folks on the line, Salesforce is the back end of the Inspire app. Um, it's what we use to create the Inspire app. So housing authorities and field offices, they may just know, know it as the Inspire software or the Inspire app. It's the app that's used to conduct the inspection. It's available on an iPad, iPhone, and I think also Android devices. Um, so what it will look like when React inspectors are out there, they'll be holding a, an iPad or a phone and um, answering questions about the standards and the conditions and deficiencies that they see. Um, I think we're doing a later session on what that will look like to inspectors. And I see a good question in the chat about the dates of future HUD training so folks can hold those on their calendars. We can get that out to, um, to everyone so that you can hold dates on your calendars for future Inspire sessions. With 15 minutes, Marta, should I do more questions or did you wanna to pivot to Cliff to say a little bit about the next few slides? Let's have Cliff do the preview and folks just know that we are gonna make sure we'll go through, we're gonna get a copy of all these questions just to make sure that we did answer all of these. And I believe that the PIH training team is also making this available as a recording. So if there's anything that we missed, you can also rewatch the recording and we'll make sure that we answer your questions as well. All uh, right, so there's a couple questions here that I, uh, I don't mind uh, answering or, or talking to. Uh, I think there's this question about the scoring calculator. Uh, in the final version of the standards, some of these items will change. Uh, it's important to note, like, for example, I think we're gonna be in a place where the missing light bulb doesn't score as an exposed conductor or life threatening. As Tara mentioned, call for aid is likely to be uh, non-scoring. Uh, there's going to be some significant changes in the standards from UPCS to Inspire, and it's important to note those changes because they will have an impact on scoring. Uh, since we've shifted from a, you know, a set of standards that includes a mix of condition and appearance and health and safety, Inspire is largely health and safety. Uh, there still are some condition and appearance conditions that we're, we're monitoring that are scored. However, the vast majority of the deficiencies are health and safety. Uh, you know, it's transitioning from a model that uh, had, you know, it was very difficult, very complicated. Uh, if you were trying to calculate your score on your own, the new Inspire scoring model is much easier. It's a four-step process. Uh, that calculator and just knowledge of the standards enables you to calculate a score on your own without undertaking some, you know, complicated math. Uh, you know, there is a, a couple of different conceptual parts of it that I think people will need to pay attention to. Uh, there is a property-wide standard for failure uh, that would result in a failing score. There's also a unit-based uh, standard of failure 
that would also result in a failure for the entire property. Uh, and that, that's a different concept than we had under UPCS. Uh, when we meet again to discuss standards and scoring, uh, I'll walk through exactly how that's done. Uh, you know, we'll provide two examples, walk through the scoring model itself. And then the other part of this, as you'll notice, we have a defect impact uh, waiting table that basically shows the significance of life threatening, severe, uh, then moderate and low deficiencies. Uh, there's an order of magnitude between those different categories. Uh, there's also a different order of magnitude on the score uh, for outside versus in, uh, inside versus unit. Uh, the unit defect counts a significant, significantly higher number of points than it does on the inside or outside location. Uh, so where we have set an inspire that we're focusing on health and safety, we're focusing on the units. It actually shows up in the scoring model uh, in the in the point table that we use for the deduction of points. Um, and I'll, and I'll go into this in greater detail when we have the standards and scoring discussion. Uh, there is, uh, I believe, in the scoring notice, if you ever read that, uh, there are some, some, some changes from the proposed scoring notice that we published on the, we're publishing in the Federal Register. Uh, but if you read the proposed scoring notice, uh, you'll get sort of a sense of where we're heading with that model. Uh, but there are some, some changes, and we'll detail those in the, uh, in the next session. And I'll be happy to take any questions if there are any with the uh, 10 minutes we have left. Do we have any more questions on the phone line? I'm not currently seeing any questions on the line. Just as a reminder, you can use the raise hand icon located um, at the bottom of WebEx if you do have a verbal question and you're logged in on WebEx. If you are dialed in separately on the phone, you can dial pound two on your telephone keypad or you can feel free to use the chat to submit additional questions. Uh, it does look like we do have someone uh, joining the verbal queue, so I'll go ahead and unmute that line. It's uh, Paul Michalk again. I, you might have covered this. I might have just missed it. Um, as far as the scoring report goes, it's going to be covered in the in, in the scoring notice. It is covered, correct? So the, the scoring notice gets into how we're going to calculate the score, um, what the final defect impact weights are for each violation, or excuse me, deficiency. Um, and then what our fail thresholds are and the sampling will all be in the final scoring notice. Uh, for a preview of that, look at our, and we can post the link, look at our, our notice that we put out in March for comment. Okay. Yeah, th that would be really interesting to look at because whenever we're reviewing the capital fund five year action plans, uh, we look at the report, we look at capital systemic deficiencies, um, those items that are of more higher value items that are repetitive uh, so that we we can, um, you know, engage with our housing authorities and make sure that they're covering, they're using their capital funds adequately. Uh, um, do you do you have any knowledge off the top of your head as far as the, the report goes? Do you have capital systemic deficiencies, ordinary uh, systemic deficiencies in the report? We don't categorize them that way. Cliff, do you want to take this? Yeah, it's, I mean, I think having had experience performing uh, PCAs, it's um, yeah. So there are some there are definitely deficiencies that would be of interest if you're performing any sort of capital needs assessment. So like any CNAs, um, you know, specifically systems, um, you know, there will be deficiencies that are related to deficient systems, electrical systems, HVAC systems, plumbing systems. Uh, you will likely notice, um, you know, we've taken a little bit of a different approach. I'm not going into greater detail about this in standards later, but, um, you know, we have a structural systems deficiency, which is largely a deficiency that's related to a significant failure, uh, something that puts the resident at risk. Uh, there are some other deficiencies that I think could potentially help you with that 
sort of work the uh, you know, we wrote in the proposed standards notice a deficiency specifically to elevated moisture. Uh, it would help capture conditions where there were water leaks. Uh, you know, it could be from plumbing, could be from the exterior environmental type moisture penetration, uh, where you see water damage. You're required to use a moisture meter. Uh, you know, if you see something like that, there's obviously some sort of condition present that would potentially relate to any sort of capital needs that a that a property may have. Um, you know, we haven't categorized these in terms of tagging them with what would potentially be helpful for a um, you know capital study or capital needs assessment. Um, but if that's something you're interested in discussing, you know, reach out to us. Uh, you know, we could potentially schedule a call we'll talking about that, and we could we could walk you through that. Uh, I know the field office is probably looking at that from a similar lens. Uh, we've had some conversations with them regarding what's useful in that context as well. So uh, that's something if you have questions about it, you know, reach out. We'd be more than happy to have the conversation and help uh, frame your thinking around that if you want to talk about it. Okay, thanks a lot, Cliff. And, and Tara, if you could send that link of what the preliminary uh, inspection report would look like, that would be of great value. I don't have that online, but I could potentially get one <laughs> from a demo. Uh, let me connect with Kevin and I can get back to folks after this. Okay, um, thanks so much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. And then I know if it's not it, probably one of our future sessions, we have a slide that covers what the top deficiencies are that we noted in the demonstration. Um, a lot of them are electrical. Um, trying to think of the next one. But fire doors is a big one. Um, I think if, if housing authorities are thinking about capital needs planning, the Inspire rule doesn't require that they install fire doors. They didn't already have them, um, but there's more deficiencies around the fire doors that are going to feel very new to them, and they may end up having to replace fire doors if they already have them um, for the way they're getting inspected under Inspire. So I would say for longer term planning, fire doors, lead-based paint evaluations, if they don't have those, Cliff, any other big capital needs things that they should be thinking about now? Yeah, this is all systems related. There's part, there are parts of Inspire that are statutory requirements. I think everyone's familiar with the carbon dioxide alarm. Uh, statute that passed a couple of years ago. Uh, as we perform the demonstration, that's something that's come up as a one of our pop, top deficiencies, just largely because uh, a lot of properties may have had one per unit, but the statute requires you know, occasionally, not occasionally, but frequently more than one per unit. Uh, that's something that's come up pretty well. There is the new statutory requirement that is effective in a year and a half. Uh, for smoke alarms, Inspire was using the same uh, standard for the location and the placement of smoke alarms, which is NFPA 72. However, this additional requirement that's going to exist under the statutory requirements that has that effective date in a year and a half requires all smoke alarms to be uh, sealed smoke alarm units with 10 year batteries. Uh, that was not part of Inspire. And this is actually a great uh, venue to make this, um, make this point. Inspire's requirement was to have uh, smoke alarms installed in the location required by NFPA 72. Uh, the new statute requires them to be installed in those locations, but also has an additional requirement that they be sealed 10-year battery units. Um, we've had to make this point during the get ready sessions, you know, that if you're making that investment in smoke alarms, you should go ahead and buy and install the sealed 10-year battery units because in a year and a half, they're not gonna meet the statutory requirements. And in a year and a half, Inspire will make a change to the standard where we will inspect for sealed 10-year battery units. Um, you know, and even without that senior, senior, the sealed 10-year battery requirement in the demonstration, you know, that was one of the top deficiencies, uh, just largely because that was a major change from UPCS to Inspire. So I think fire doors are important, as Tara pointed out, it was one of the top deficiencies. And it's not always a replacement. Sometimes it's just a repair of the hardware or just making an adjustment to make sure it closes properly. But, uh, you know, actually one of the top deficiencies was a propped open fire door. Uh, I think we were surprised by the number of properties that we went to where they actually just propped the fire doors open. And, you know, in terms of preventing the spread of a fire, if a fire were to occur, that's one of the most important things that you do is just not prop it open. But uh, there were doors that were had some damaged hardware, didn't close properly. You know, I think those are things that you can make adjustments or repair hardware. Uh, there are some capital expenses there, but not quite to the extent if you're repairing a door. Uh, there were some doors cited during the demonstration that needed to be replaced. 
uh, not quite at the same level as the hardware repairs, but uh, you know they were significant. But I think carbon dioxide alarms and smoke alarms were a fairly significant uh, number of observations during the demonstration. So I think it's that's something you probably want to talk to properties about. Right. Okay. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Okay. Did we have time to take another question? Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and unmute the person we have waiting on the phone. Hey, Tara, this is a, a Damien. I was just going to ask Paul if he was going to shoot you guys an email uh, about the capital activities, if he could just copy me on that, because I'd like to participate in that call as well. Awesome. Thank you, Damien. Nice to hear you on the line. I was actually going to make a pitch for staff to watch for those competitive capital fund programs, too. Um, a lot of the things that are going to get inspected more closely under Inspire are housing-related hazards. Okay, sounds good. Uh, yeah, we want to be part of any call that we can be a part of that, that kind of crosses over with uh, capital discussion. So, uh, Paul, just a heads up for you. Thank you. Thanks, Damien. All right, no problem. Do we have any other callers on the waiting on the line? Sorry for the wait there. I currently see no additional callers waiting. Okay, so I'm having a coughing fit, so maybe we can just go ahead and wrap up. Uh, we do see these all these questions in the chat. Um, we will get some answers out to you. We will share these slides, and then we'll also share the dates of the future sessions. Um, keep sending us feedback to inspiredhut.gov. It's there on the slide. Thank you so much for your participation today. We love lively groups with lots of questions. Um, we'll look forward to taking more of your questions in the later sessions and making sure we get everybody up to speed on what Inspire is and what's coming your way. So thanks again, everybody. Uh, Cliff, do you want to say anything? And please feel free to reach out uh, for the offices that have reached out in the past. We've, you know, we've Usually been able to accommodate them pretty quickly and schedule a meeting if they've had questions related to standards or even the notices or scoring. Um, you know, and, and you know, we're open to conversation at any time we can get it scheduled. If there's a question about anything, really uh, feel free to reach out and, and ask us about it or schedule a meeting, anything. We'd love to help you. Okay, that concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.